colleagues. Good evening to all of you. First, I will appreciate the effect of the scientific committee of Tamil Nadu IPS. They have translated my missus into actions. Basically, the main objective of this webinar is to provide an opportunity for the, our young TNIP psychiatrists. Uh, speaker, Dr. Sudhagar. And Dr. Sudhagar has made a history in Tamil Nadu IPS by organizing a non pharma state conference. And we have another speaker, Dr. Lashmi Prabha. Uh, today, topics are the deconstruction of the model of psychiatric training. And also, another topic is addressing the drug on non adherence in the clinical practice by Dr. Lashmi Prabha. Uh, I hope this, uh, this both the topic will be very useful for the practitioners as well as the teachers and the postgraduates also is being here. For not to postgraduate also, I, I think they, they are child. With a small introduction, I'll hand out this. Today's uh, speakers are um, Dr. Sudhakar. Uh, he is going to talk about deconstructing the models of uh, psychiatry training. Uh, he he is uh, he's done his uh, MBBS from uh, Chengalpattu Medical College. He has uh, done his MD Psychiatry from Institute of Mental Health. He is currently Senior Assistant Professor at Chengalpattu Medical College and um, currently is a Secretary Chennai Psychiatry Society. His areas of interest uh, are Community Psychiatry and De-Addiction Psychiatry, Undergraduate and Postgraduate Teaching and Training. Uh, we cannot forget uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, conduction of the TANPSYCON, last TANPSYCON, without the pharma involvement and it was a tremendous achievement and it was applauded uh, throughout uh, India uh, by all the IPS members. He had um, uh, become a role model for that. Uh, I uh, congratulate Sudhakar, uh, Dr. Sudhakar for that. Our uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Prabha. Uh, she has uh, done, done her uh, uh, MD in uh, NIMHANS and uh, 13 years of uh, uh, experience as a psychiatrist. Currently, she is a uh, consultant psychiatrist, Miot International Hospital, Chennai. Uh, previously, she was uh, associate professor of psychiatry in Sri Balaji Medical College. Uh, she has got a best outgoing student, Tanjavur Medical College, University Gold Medal. Her uh, research papers have got a lot of uh, awards. And she has been a speaker in multiple forums and presented papers in the state and the national conferences. Her areas of interest are in liaison psychiatry, psycho-oncology, child and adolescent psychiatry, and behavioral addiction. I'd like to introduce the moderator also, Dr. Avudayapan. Uh, he has uh, done his uh, undergraduation in uh, Perundurai Medical College and postgraduate training in Tanjavur Medical College. Currently, he is a professor of psychiatry in uh, Mahatma Gandhi Medical College, uh, where he joined as assistant professor. His uh, interest lies mainly on community awareness and psychology. He has uh, various publications in uh, IJP Annals of Indian Psychiatry. Uh, he has been a speaker in various CMEs and conferences. Kodai uh, uh, Tansaikon, uh, he was presenting about transgenders and it was a very a uh, good one and it was a lot of work has been done in that area transgender area i appreciate uh, dr avadeyappan for this for that i hand over the mic to dr avadeyappan for moderating this event today thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you for your kind words uh, for today's session we have two topics the first topic is uh, deconstructing the models of psychiatric training to be done by dr s sudhakar uh, to introduce the topic, uh, actually, we are in a crossroads of uh, psychiatric training. Uh, the NMC is pushing out new guidelines and they are putting up new day timelines and uh, newer expectations. Uh, and a lot of things are in flux. And especially with regard to uh, our uh, field, the problem lies in uh, that uh, that uh, they are not the what we expect from nmc and uh, what they expect from us are uh, tangentially different so uh, we i hope uh, dr sudhagar sir will uh, enlighten us more in this regard over to you sir thank you sir uh, thank you ma'am for the introduction and for the uh, words of appreciation uh, i'd like to move on to my topic Uh, the topic given to me was uh, deconstructing the models of psychiatric training. 
uh, which is indeed a, a unique topic which i initially felt would be much more difficult to present uh, but once i went through uh, most of the article uh, the article published in most of the indian journals i felt it more interesting and in fact i learned a lot which i would like to share with you all in the next half an hour and i would like to stick to the time given to me uh, the outline of my presentation will be uh, the current traditional trading that is happening in india and in our states which we are doing even till date and a few slides on the types of learners as far as the post graduates are concerned since this is this is about psychiatry training i included both undergraduate training as well as post graduate training what the nmc has stated at present and the pitfalls and the final thing would be way forward how to overcome from our own traditional way of training so there was a question why this topic was chosen and there are so many other interesting topics in core psychiatry uh, after going through about the topic in the last two weeks i felt uh, we all know that there is an increasing burden of illness more so in the post covid period and we still know that the treatment gap is wide where most of the 70 to 80% of the population still do not have the opportunity to avail the treatment for mental illness more so in the rural population and as far as resources are concerned whether it could be manpower or your infrastructure or your equipment or trained professionals it is inadequate and there is unequal distribution throughout our country and as far as budget allocation concerned you know it is only 0.5 percent towards health and a very meager amount is being allotted towards mental health you all know about the recent Delhi Manas project for which some amount of budget was allocated by the uh, government of India and there is a considerable variation in psychiatric training across India uh, between states, between institutes and within the state too we saw different in the training that has been given to the postgraduate and the most important point for this topic would be the uh, uh, employment status of the current postgraduate so uh, can we assure them that you will have a good job in the future is a questionable so this is one uh, common thing which every teacher would tell to their post graduate or to their undergraduate during my day uh, during my period of training so what are all the things i did what my teachers have told right this is the way we always start our method of training to the current post graduate where most of my teachers and even as a teacher we used to tell them that we used to give a lot of importance to the phenomenology treating and all these things does not happen in the current among the current postgraduate and the learning is more about patient centric now which has gradually shifted to current postgraduate more rely on digital learning and we had or the uh, current psychiatrists or the teachers they had more exposure in basic sciences and neurology and there were exams at the end of each semester and there was less number of pg seats during those days and many candidates were trained with the postgraduate exam so this is what most of the uh, teachers and faculty they tell or advise to their postgraduate which uh, we must move on from this and we must include our traditional method as well as the newer method which the nmc is taking at present so you all would have seen this uh, website the competency based uh, medical education they have stated an undergraduate curriculum you can see most of the uh, uh, points they have included like uh, they have included the uh, know know how shows shows how which i will explain in detail they are concerned more about the knowledge skills attitude values responsiveness and communication the cbme what they say is this is based on the health needs of the society so that is how the objectives and the curriculum has been framed so they say that the traditional model is uh, more like will be most of a lecture based case based where we have some education objectives chapters to be done and you have certain assessment methods at the end of your course whereas the uh, curriculum based model it is based on the health needs of the society and they have documented certain competencies or outcomes which an undergraduate as a postgraduate has to definitely know the curriculum is based on these competencies and the assessment is also based on 
as far as the curriculum based medical education under graduation is concerned most of the uh, general hospital psychiatry units should have been uh, going through this in the last four years right to add few uh, points about this this started from the 2019 batch that is the first batch to be included under this uh, tbmb and as far as psychiatry is concerned the code is c yes and you want to know where it is available you go to the nmc website you will have you the curriculum and the volume to include all your psychiatry topics and competencies it starts from the page 203 As far as psychiatry is concerned, there is total of 19 topics. It starts from mental health, uh, history taking, stress management, then comes all your uh, psychotic disorders, substance use, anxiety, mood disorders, and all these things. Uh, what is unique in this curriculum based medical education? You know, there is a one month foundation course for all the undergraduate students who join in the first year of medicine, and we psychiatrists should be asked to do two to three topics in all this foundation course. They have included early clinical exposure right from the first year of MBBS, and they have told you or they have incorporated a lot of newer teaching methods, right? And you would have heard of this term ATCOM, this which is attitude, ethics, and communication, for which a lot of time duration and importance is being given for the undergraduate. And there is one more thing called the alignment and integration module, uh, where the psychiatry topic. There is two integration called horizontal integration and vertical integration. Horizontal integration it will be allied with your medicine and allied specialty. Say you uh, you are going to discuss a topic about alcohol dependence, right? Then you can ask the physician to have a topic on uh, say alcoholic liver disease, right? Or the you can include the neurologist in the management of alcoholic uh, alcohol induced dementia or alcoholic neuropathy, neurological complications of alcohol. That is. Horizontal integration, vertical integration is something. Say uh, there is a topic on limbic system for the first years in the anatomy session, where they might include you to talk about the psychiatric aspects or the role of limbic system in psychiatry. And the other one is uh, this curriculum implementation support program, which all the faculties they are going to make it mandatory where you have to get trained in this system so that you will know all the newer teaching methods which the NMC is. Asking all of us to do, and there are elective postings for the undergraduate in which psychiatry is one of the subject, and you have a guideline for logbook. And the most important thing is the formative assessment. Usually, in the non-CBME batches, there will be a summative assessment at the end of each year. Now they have included this formative assessment where, from the first clinical year, it will be added and it will be considered for the internal assessment in the final year. <coughs> So you all uh, know about this uh, posting as far as psychiatry is concerned. We have this uh, teaching hours of 40 theory classes in which 25 uh, will be taught directly. 10 is the form of tutorial seminars or integrated teaching. We have called the horizontal and vertical, and uh, five hours for the self-directed learning, which mostly happens in the pre-final year or in the third MBBS part. Uh, sorry for the long uh, letters. uh this is what you will see in your uh, uh psychiatry curriculum for undergraduate where you will be presented with competency right and you will have a domain where you will be uh focusing on the knowledge skill the affect part or the communication part and the level where the person the student has to whether know or know how or show or show how right and they are also given the suggested Teaching or learning methods, say bedside clinic, uh, it can be a small group discussion. The DOAP is uh, demonstration, observation, assessment, and performance. And they have also included assessment methods, what to be done to be assessed for these students at the end of the session, where there can be skill assessment, written exam, viva voce, or even multiple choice questions, right? And is there any of the competencies where? The student has to get certified. As far as psychiatry is concerned, it is no, right? We have so many competencies, but none is required mandatory to be certified at the end of your clinical course. The same thing which I have described now with the previous tabla column. So uh, there is a total of 19 topics and the uh, 117 outcomes or competencies. The domain surface, the domain which uh, focus has been given on. 
given on is the knowledge skill the affect part and the communication the teaching method as i have told it includes recent clinic lecture small group discussion and your uh, demonstration observation assessment and program so what we are doing at present we all know before the non cpm batch it was only two weeks of clinical posting in the second year but now we have uh, two weeks in the second year and two weeks in the pre final year and it was 20 hour of theory classes in the past which we used to do in the final year but now it is 40 hours of classes which happens in the pre final year as you all know psychiatry is given important 20 for the final year exams where they will have one essay or if they are lucky enough they will get one more short note and the two weeks of psychiatry posting compulsory posting the crrgs which they have been renamed as crmi at present uh there is what uh, uh study by case jacob uh, published in indian journal of psychological medicine in year 2019 where they have done the appraisal of this uh, new competency based curriculum uh so the final conclusion what they have done is uh, this is indeed a appreciable advance as far as training is concerned but the continuous use of the specialist concept diagnosis in a tertiary care center means the opportunity to train the student uh, for presentations that happen in a primary and secondary care has been lost so most of the competencies you would see they consider as core competencies where you tell the student these are the things you need to know and there are many other competence competencies which are not considered as core and the students might not know at all and they have mentioned that there is a need to collaborate with lias speakers in general and family medicine and community health who right run the primary and secondary medical facilities to develop a curriculum this is after implementation of the cbme in 2009 so with all this as far as undergraduates are concerned what are we doing even at present uh, we still have a lot of confusion with regard to what are all these competencies we have been teaching all these for years together and now you are dictating us to take us only these kind of topics so we again go to the undergraduate classes we teach whatever topic we want to do and this is what is happening in my college and i hope so it is happening in other colleges too we still persist with the traditional teaching and we are not able to move away towards what the cbme is asking to do and teaching methods again we stick on to most of the lecture based uh, teaching to students which again the cbme said this is not the only way you have any innovative methods of teaching and even the assessment method it has to be done at the end of your theory class as well as at the end of your two weeks of clinical posting uh, still most of the medical college general hospital psychiatry is struggling to come with these cbme terms and we hope that it will be settled down in another few years uh, one small suggestion would be since the competencies are the same across the state uh, generally what happens in our institution is the administration will ask uh, two days before uh, psychiatry department to give what are all the competencies they are going to give for the first clinical year for the next two weeks right when they ask us the day before it will be very tough for us to do then what we used to do is we used to ask in other general hospital psychiatry you know, i used to ask in king park medical college dr daniel is there we will send whatever the competencies we have we, we would have prepared and you just change the name from king park to central and give it to the administration and we stick on to what we are taking in the theory classes i think if there is a standard uh, teaching schedule both for clinical and the theory for undergraduate should be uniform throughout the state then we might start practicing what the current cbme is asking us so way forward would be a uh, uniform training of undergraduate across the state uh, we need to adhere to the cpm curriculum and we can add competencies if needed there is no one to restrict us please give a lot of importance to the formative assessment which is there for every undergraduate the scoring has to be given and it has to be submitted to the administration at the end of your clinical posting and theory classes faculty should know as well as learn about the innovative methods of teaching for which you need to attend this a uh, curriculum implementation support program which is a three day training program and the feedback and critical appraisal from the students is very essential uh, as far as you need to improve your training of undergraduate and most of the uh, research articles as far as ut training in our country is concerned they have suggested for a separate university exam 
for MBBS students in psychiatry, preferably in the pre-final year, to inculcate uh, more interest and learning towards psychiatry. Uh, with this, I would like to move forward to uh, the PG psychiatry training in India. Uh, uh, we know we all know what are all the uh, uh, psychiatry courses available. You know, MD now DPM. I think it has gone. Most of the DPM seats or MD DPM seats has been converted to an MD. DNP is there in certain institutes, and we know that uh, DM subspecialty in psychiatry is there in uh, three or four premier institutes in our country. Uh, as far as India is concerned, total number of psychiatry PGs who come out graduate uh, every year almost just crossed thousand per year. As far as our state is concerned, we know we have 82 medical colleges in Tamil Nadu at present. And that is where the uh, NMC has told there will be no more new medical colleges in Tamil Nadu because we have reached that uh, doctor population ratio. And as far as MP postgraduates are concerned, it is 95 uh, in a year in Tamil Nadu, 27 in a year in Pondi, accounting for 122 graduates who are coming out of MD psychiatry from an institute every year. 122 new psychiatrists are coming into our society, and. As I told, psychiatry training. There is a, we have institutes where people do psychiatry. The Institute of Mental Health in Chennai, and we have general hospital psychiatry units. And the employment status again, as I have told, is one of the bigger question for all the future psychiatrists. Uh, this is uh, the DM uh, super specialty, but uh, most of the articles which I went through, I have told it should not be called as a super specialty; it should be considered as a sub specialty in psychiatry. Where you have a lot of seats in child and adolescent psychiatry in the premier institutes, say Niman, Aims, and uh, your uh, PG psychiatry, uh, geriatric psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. You have fellowship courses in foreign forensic psychiatry in Niman. Okay. Uh, as far as PG training, before this uh, CBME have stated again, it was the same three years for MD and two years for your DPM. And long back there were exams at the end of each semester, first year, second year, and third year. But then it has changed to at the end of three years. Uh, now there is exam at the end of three years. There is no change in it. The exam pattern has considerably changed uh, from what has been practiced before. Initially, they used to have separate exams in uh, uh, neurology. Uh, even you will have medicine patients where will be asked to present patients with uh, uh, abdomen cases, uh, your cardiac cases. And there will be a separate neurologist as an examiner. It has changed, and now psychiatrists are the ones who will be uh, assessing the neurology short case too. And that is at, at what is happening even at present. Uh, publication was not considered mandatory for uh, postgraduates who are appearing for exams long before. But as far as the current batches are concerned, they would need to publish a paper, and they should have presented a paper in a conference, and they should have presented a poster. And it was more of summative assessment at the end of three years before. Now importance is given for formative assessment and the summative assessment. Uh, usually, uh, internal assessment mark. Uh, generally, when the university asks for the internal assessment mark, we discuss with the professor associate, and then we give randomly marks for the postgraduates who are appearing for exam. Now, strictly adhering to the formative assessment makes us uh, to give a structured. Uh, Method to give the internal assessment marks for both graduates, and we, as you all know, DRP district residency program it is there for the past one year and it is happening. Every postgraduate has to undergo three months of uh, this district residency program in a district hospital within your district. Again, the curriculum-based medical education, as far as the PG training in psychiatry is concerned, they focus mainly on mainly on these three domains, like your UG curriculum. On your cognitive, affective, and psychomotor domain, because <coughs> all these uh, are there in your uh, NMC guidelines. If you go there, you have a psychiatry curriculum which is revised last year, and if you look into the curriculum, so they have addressed uh, at the end of three years, the postgraduate should be able to perform a detailed mental status examination. Uh, they should do cognitive behavior therapy, supportive psychotherapy. Modified ECT and non-invasive neuromodulation, clinical IQ assessment, management of alcohol intoxication withdrawal, opioid withdrawal, management of delirious patients, and crisis intervention. So, 
after going all through this you need to understand at the end of you should be able to perform cbt psychotherapy and non invasive neuromodulation iq assessment which uh, still it is not happening in most of the institutes uh, due to various reasons which you have mentioned due to inavailability of resources again at the end of 3 years you should be able to assess or elicit the following symptom domain should be able to assess and elicit psychotic symptoms differentiate seizure and pseudo seizure anxiety affective and cognitive symptoms catatonia melancholic and behavioral symptoms of development and disorder you should be able to perform under supervision at the end of 3 years behavior therapy family therapy interpersonal therapy cpt and other newer therapy first level psychological intervention for sexual abuse sexual assault and domestic violence and genetic counseling again it is a big bigger question mark how many general hospital psychiatry units or even institutes are able to train the uh, residents or post graduates at the end of this three year session to do all these things under supervision So a small recap of the uh, postings which a psychiatric postgraduate has to undergo in a three-year period. You see, uh, they have to be posted in neurology for two months. Internal medicine now they have included emergency medicine for a period of one month, either internal medicine or emergency medicine. Licensed psychiatry for three months. A psychiatric hospital or an institute. Uh, Unforensic psychiatry for a period of one month. The clinical psychology for a period of one month. I know most of the Uh, at least fifty to sixty percent of the general hospital psychiatry units do not have a clinical psychology, right? So, clinical psychology for one month, addiction psychiatry for three months, childhood adolescent psychiatry for three months, community psychiatry for two months, and elective posting for two months. So, are the posting of postgraduate residents as per this schedule? Again, it is questionable. So, what is the ground reality? So what the CBME has asked us to do, what are the things a postgraduate should be able to perform at the end of the uh, uh, three-year course? Uh, this occurred in the, uh, this happened in the IJP Article 2022 Psychiatry Training in India, where the president is addressed by the uh, IPS president, where he uh, was talking about the psychiatry training in India. The ground reality is lack of standardized training program and assessment. As I have told, it differs from institute to institute and A general hospital psychiatry bit to the other one, depending upon the resources that is available, and insufficient interdepartmental learning. Right, you liars with your neurology, you are liars with your medicine, you are liars with your anatomy, anatomy, physiology, and that has come down now. Uh, unequal distribution of research opportunities, outdated curricula, absence of community exposure. The community psychiatry there is a three month posting for uh, post graduates. District residency program doesn't come under this community psychiatry. Uh, even in district residency program, if you see most of the postgraduates, they take up a district hospital where they have a very simple work, go or run the OPD and come, or they get a NOC, they get a district hospital nearby to their uh, uh, native place. They have a good three months of time and then they come back. They will be completely out of touch with the psychiatry. The best possible thing would be to ask your postgraduate. To go and attend the district mental health program, so they can attend the three three months of TRP training can be utilized for district mental health program. They can go with the district psychiatrist, and that would help them to get exposed to the community psychiatry. And uh, other ground realities that have been described is uh, ignoring cultural variations in health, poor exposure to brain pathology, neuropathology, neuro neurology, and neurophysiology. And there is less of emphasis on physiological basis of behavior. Uh, this is one interesting article in the uh, IJP 2018 by uh, Sandeep Grover. Uh, there was an evaluation of psychiatric training in India. It was done for psychiatrists who are practicing uh, both in private as well as in government colleges. Uh, so 68 percent have told the training was good and adequate overall when it was conducted. But there was a rating of poor and very poor training in the following areas. This was given by psychiatrists who are practicing or working in a medical college, both government and private. So they have told that there is a very poor training in sub specialities, be child and adolescent, geriatric, addiction, and other sub specialities. Uh, very poor training in RPA, RPMS, 
CBS and other non-invasive neuromodulation techniques. Rehabilitation psychiatry, again, I know it will be uh, completely nil in general hospital psychiatry bits and to, extend, to some extent in institutes. Since we have not given a lot of importance to rehabilitation psychiatry, uh, most of the NGOs have taken up this rehabilitation psychiatry. And forensic psychiatry, psychodynamic, neuroimaging, psychotherapy, orientation to private practice. Again, uh, most of the postgraduates uh, would have not been exposed to what to do and what you need to adjust yourself in a private practice. Statistics, writing skills, ethical principles, psychosexual medicine. Again, uh, there is not much of discussion about psychosexual medicine. Again, it is taken, the field is mostly taken up by non psychiatrists and lesser exposure in research method also. So this is an uh, interesting article in IJP 2008. So uh, a, a bit of thing about the types of learners, like if you still stick on to the traditional method of uh, training where I have been a student, where I have listened to whatever my teacher have told. Uh, if, I, if my teacher asked me to do something, I have to do it obediently. I have not... Uh, uh, speak against them, I listen to them and all these things. But you need to understand that the students keep changing year after year and you need to understand what type of a student is and what is the preferential learning style for it. A student's learning style affects their motivation to learn and teaching methods can be adjusted to foster more in-depth learning and this, this can be done by knowing the learning preference of your student. It's not your Typical textbook and lecture based learning, you need to go and try innovative methods of learning. Uh, there are certain learning styles, I'm not going into the details. Uh, all these things are given in your psychiatric clinic 2021 article on uh, medical education in psychiatry, uh, where they are given these three approaches uh, neurocognitive approach, where they learn by all your uh, sensory systems, your visual, oral, kinesthetic, kind of and uh, your uh, reading and writing and all these things. A uh, personality based approach uh, where they observe, they reflect, and then they conceptualize and then they try out what they have learned. Uh, I'm not going into the details. Uh, I would suggest with this PCNA uh, article, Medical Education in Psychiatry, uh, published in the year two, 2021, where they have discussed all these uh, newer and innovative methods that need to be considered as far as psychiatry training. One is simulation based teaching. As far as undergraduates have known, you will be having a simulation skin lab in each of your teaching institutes. And as far as psychiatry is concerned, uh, this article says you need to incorporate simulation based teaching where postgraduates uh, would be exposed to different scenarios, different kind of a patients or simulated patients, which we do in our RC. And uh, this method has to be incorporated. Cultural humility. So this is something where they discuss about the term cultural competence and cultural humility, where the psychiatrist or the residents, they have been trained uh, to have an open framework in approaching a person and to consider cultural background, particularly when you uh, look into a culture where there is a lot of uh, inequalities and you have a lot of minority population. So you need to consider all the cultural background and Consider that person from that aspect and you need to assess the person. Computer based searching, uh, as I have told, even now I have difficulty in this uh, online presentation. I need to get the help of one of my uh, uh, residents to see to that everything is uh, set there so that I'll be able to be in time for the presentation. Uh, all the postgraduate teachers or the undergraduate teachers, you have to update yourself in all the recent methods in computer-based teaching because all the postgraduate and students, they have the digital world in their hand. They want everything to be accessible and easier and they prefer all these digital methods of teaching. So you need to uh, come down from your classroom method of teaching and learn the newer methods in computer-based teaching. Teaching psychotherapy, as we have discussed, you need to allot uh, your postgraduate uh, different kind of a patient, say anxiety, depression, for whom you need to do all the psychotherapeutic techniques under the guidance and supervision of the clinical psychologist, and it has to be documented in the law. And one another interesting teaching method is narrative medicine. Uh, narrative medicine, one of the classical examples is clinical witness, uh, which we used to describe mostly seen in uh, 
uh, undergraduate uh, psychiatric quiz and postgraduate psychiatric quiz competitions where you will have a clinical win that round. So that is what is a classical example of narrative medicine. Some other classical examples could be, uh, say, perspective of a autobiography of a patient, uh, sometimes uh, poetry, art form, uh, even uh, cinema uh, based on uh, psychiatric topics. All these things come under narrative medicine. And uh, this article says that narrative medicine has to be incorporated in postgraduate psychiatric training. And the neuroscience education, as you know, that uh, lesser exposure in neurology and basic sciences has come now in the recent years. So more exposure to neuroscience, neurology would help the postgraduate to uh, consider the presence of any kind of a behavior they can relate with the brain activity, brain region implicated or brain pathology, in addition to your social and psychological factors. And creating successful presentation, this is for the PG teachers and faculty, not for the residents. So you need to be creative as well as you need to create successful presentations where you will be able to attract or involve the residents so that they have some kind of in-depth learning from which they learn and they go on to become successful uh, teachers or they do good presentations in the future. So, but what we are doing again, <coughs> still sticking on to the traditional methods of teaching uh, with a strong point of view that that would be the uh, uh, best method to do. And uh, now the uh, uh, focus is moving towards more on a biomedical model than on the biopsychosocial model. So, these two postgraduates are trained in uh, giving a prescription, giving a proper drug, or giving a proper repeat note. So, this is what most of the postgraduate residents are being trained at present. So, this biomedical or the reductionistic model has to be superseded by the biopsychosocial model, which was there in the past. As I have told, inadequate exposure in subspecialties because uh, most of the general hospital psychiatry units do not have a child and adolescent psychiatry unit, a separate de-addiction unit, a separate geriatric psychiatry unit. So we show all the specialty clinics as far as NMC units are concerned. We have a big board and a census. But actually, in practice, it doesn't happen in most of the units. So the exam pattern varies across uh, each teaching institute. As I have told, uh, you have a long case. One short case in psychiatry and one short case in neurology. You have a viva voce and RC. And again, examiners, uh, it is a bigger issue with our Tamil Nadu MGR University where they will not allow the examiners even the, a week before the exams. And uh, now this has become a norm where the concerned professor or the uh, judge of the department, they can select the examiners whom they want to come and they can recommend to the university. I think uh, assessment and the exam methods has to be uniform uh, across all the institutes in our state at least. And the exam results, as I have told, uh, now we all move towards 100% uh, pass percentage. I think this formative assessment and summative assessment uh, would bring a much more standardized approach for the exam uh, evaluation. So that is where uh, we request everyone to go follow this formative assessment. It is very, very important. So, uh, with all this, what the CBM is asking us to do, and uh, the new innovative methods of teaching and all these things, so what should we do from now on? Uh, so, I think every teaching uh, faculty, they should know the CBME curriculum, right? Which is very, very important. Once you go through this thoroughly, then only you will know what you can do from here on. So then you can plan accordingly to your available resources. I understand there is inadequate resources across many different general hospital psychiatry units. Probably it is the role of the uh, uh, state mental health authority or the state government to ensure that adequate resources are available across all the teaching institutes in our state. And more exposure is needed for psychiatry residents in community psychiatry, more so in school mental health, which the district mental health program is doing at present. But the psychiatry residents are, need, are not exposed to these community psychiatry and school mental health. And they need good amount of exposure in subspecialities if it is available within your institute, it is well and good. If it is not available within your institute, 
uh, you can send the postgraduate to the next institute where they want the sub specialty and they need adequate training in consultation licensed psychiatry for which you need a good interdepartmental coordination you need to have a good relationship uh, with the other department so that your postgraduate residents will also get adequate exposure training and consultation licensed psychiatry which is considered to be one of the most important part as far as psychiatry is concerned when he is undergoing the training as well as when he moves out to go in for a clinical and private practice in addition to the biopsychosocial model which we always uh, teach to our postgraduate social aspects and cultural factors need to be considered right and the legal aspects in psychiatry and more so about the mental health care act 2017 where all our uh, teaching institutes have become mental health establishment at present but still uh, how many of us do follow the admission procedure discharge procedure how many of us represent to the mental health review board whether the mental health review board is functioning in your district there are so many aspects but the post graduates have to be trained in all these aspects so these are the recommendations again by the psychiatry training in india in uh, article in ipp 2022 by uh, nn ross uh again sorry for the uh, call letters uh, this is uh, uh, this is the last slide yeah last last two slides sir yeah, yes Uh, this is the student appraisal form for uh, MD in psychiatry, where you can see uh, you have scoring up to nine. Uh, it is based on the scholastic aptitude and learning, and you can see logbook is also included in it. One point four, a care of the patients, uh, professional attributes, right, and there is a space for additional uh, comment. And the assessment it has to be discussed with the concerned PG resident on what basis we are given the marks. So this has to be done every month. right this is what we call it as a formative assessment and i think this assessment would even uh, motivate both the faculties as well as the students postgraduate students to improve on all these aspects so that the performance as well as the training becomes better in a teaching institute so the take home message would be uh, need to ensure adequate training is provided to the undergraduate and postgraduate students as per norms established by the nmc under the curriculum based medical education you need to try innovative methods of learning uh, innovative methods of teaching and still we need to move on from the traditional methods of teaching though it is also important at present give a lot of importance to the formative assessment document and discuss with your post graduates about the assessment process and get an effective feedback and appraisal have a healthy discussion with your post graduates what could be that better get the feedback from so that you can improve upon yourself how to train your post graduates and you need a better interdepartmental coordination within your institute this paves a long way in training your post graduates in life in psychiatry so thank you i thank the indian psychiatric society for giving me this opportunity uh, to present in this uh, quite a different topic uh, i think on this rainy day i want to uh, uh, say a loud thank you to all So thank you. I am ready to take up any questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was indeed a very uh, nice and elaborate presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to give some comments, and then I have few questions, sir. Uh, the my basic thing is uh, the CBME curriculum is standing on two things. Uh, one is uh, andragogy. That is, the learner will uh, decide upon himself how to learn, and he will implement the learning. That is the thing. And uh, second thing is uh, standardized training. first of all in our if at all we look at our uh, undergraduate uh, attitude their attitude is to pass the exam their their uh, whole attitude is to clear out mbbs and to go to the md and whatever md they want to take up they want to do that so if in that case uh, would the formative assessment and other uh, evaluation would be ide ideal for an undergraduate uh, based education that's the first thing we need to ask and uh, then we have a question of standardized training uh we psychiatrist ourselves are not very sure about how much psychology training is needed for psychiatrist how much neurology training is needed for psychiatrist be both these uh, disciplines uh, superimposing on uh, our uh, discipline uh, it becomes very difficult few of them require uh, uh, few of the examiners they ask a very in depth question in psychology which uh, some of them say is not necessary so we ourselves are not very clear about what is necessary and what is not there in that case how much standardized 
organization in training we can do and uh, two more questions are small questions one in the absence of milestones how much uh, we can evaluate formative assessment in the western country cpme is based on milestones if you're not passing the milestones then uh, even formative assessment is not there then it is not there current scenario is formative assessment is not given any uh, validity in the final assessment so even if the pg doesn't have any aptitude to learn if he can pass the final exam even if his formative assessment scores are less he can clearly pass out the exam so how this formative assessment is going to be integrated in the current summative assessment is again a question so i hope uh, we can answer those questions sir sir what happened sir can ah, yes, sir? Question after the second speaker presentation ah sure sir okay, okay. Uh -huh. uh, Sudha, okay, then we can keep it after a second speaker presentation, sir. Thank you. Then uh, I, I invite uh, Dr. Lakshmi Prabha, madam, to present her topic on uh, uh, how to address non adherence non adherence is a very long, it is a very chronic issue and we have had a multiple discussion, but still it is unresolved. So I hope ma'am will share more uh, ideas about that. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And a special thanks to Dr. P.T. Panan, sir, for bringing me back to this academic domain again. So, uh, the topic that is given to me is to, about how to address non adherence I think this is a very important topic. And before getting into the topic, I would like to share two case scenarios. So, which I came across in my practice. So one scenario is a three member family where ma both mother and the son have severe mental illness, that is schizophrenia. And uh, the father who is taking, that is the husband who is taking care of the, uh, those two people, is posted in some other state due to his job. So this people, uh, both of them, had some flare-up of the symptom. That was when they were brought to the OPD. And uh, when they came, uh, the psychoeducation was given to the uh, uh, caretaker about the illness and uh, the need for long-acting depot injection was considered. So after psychoeducating and then uh, giving the importance of uh, give, highlighting the importance of the long-acting depot injection that will help them to manage this flare-up of symptoms, uh, the uh, caretaker considered it and they came after uh, six months for follow-up with reduction in symptoms after treatment optimization. But I was very curious to know as to how he ensured compliance in both these people. So he came out with a scenario wherein uh, he told that whenever his son is all right, he will take the medications properly and he will take a photo of his mother whenever she attempts to take the medication. And he used to send this photo to his uh, father every day. That is how the compliance is ensured. The adherence is ensured in this case, even though the caretaker is staying uh, in some other state. To come across to an another scenario wherein uh, an anxiety disorder patient, after giving the medication, they get better with resolution of symptoms and then they stop the medications of their own. And they come after six months with the relapse, right? So this, with this background, I would like to go into the topic, uh, how to address non-adherence in psychiatric settings. Uh, as an overview, I'll be talking about what is adherence versus non-adherence, what is the prevalence of non-adherence and its impact, how to measure adherence, and what are the various influencing factors and ways to address it. Next slide. So adherence or compliance, it is most of the time it is interchangeably used. A medication regime is generally defined as the extent to which the patients take the medications as prescribed by their healthcare providers. Whereas non-adherence, it is a case in which a person's behavior in taking medication, it does not correspond with the agreed recommendations from the health professional. And this is the definition that is given by WHO for the non-adherence. Next slide. So I was curious to know whether uh, psychiatry as a speciality having lot of stigma, uh, whether non-adherence is more in this speciality or is it common across other medical conditions as well. So this is a publication that is uh, in Oxford American Psychiatry Journal in 2009, where they have compared the non-adherence rate across various disorders, uh, the non-communicable diseases. As you can see in this table, you can see the coronary heart disease has a higher non-adherence rate of 40 to 50 percent, which is in comparison to the severe mental illness, that is schizophrenia, which is 30 to 60 percent. And as you see down, uh, all these disorders, psychiatric disorders, uh, that is schizophrenia, major depression, the bipolar, everything 
it is more than 30 to 40 percent. So the higher non-adherence rates are seen in patients who suffer from psychiatric disorders and the compliance to psychiatric disorders is very, very essential. And it is also a very challenging thing in the management of major psychiatric disorders. Next slide. They say the non-adherence rates in psychiatric settings, it ranges from 4 to 72 percent. It varies because, uh, because of the varied diagnosis in uh, varied population where the study has been conducted, because of the variable follow-up periods and different definitions that has been used and the different measurement methods that has been used for measuring the adherence. So, however, when you see in clinical trials, the adherence rate is very higher than in the routine care. Next slide. So, for the next few slides, I'll be running through how uh, the non-adherence rates varies across various disorders. Lacro et al. he found that the mean frequency of non-adherence was about 40.5%. And uh, based on the pharmacy records, based on the medication refill rates, they found the non-adherence rates varies between 24 to 40%. In another case control study, they found that 61% of the patients, they had adherence problems at some point over a four-year po period of follow-up. And in people who suffer from bipolar affective disorder, about 20 to 60% of the people, they are non-adherent at any given time with a mean rate of 40%. Next slide. In another longitudinal study, they found that patients who had started on lithium, the median time to discontinuation was 76 days. And in a landmark study, that is CATI study, approximately 40% of the patients, they discontinued their antipsychotic medications on their own. And uh, alarmingly, nearly half of the medical outpatients who are receiving antidepressant medications, they discontinue the treatment during the first month. Next slide. So they say uh, the range of uh, medication non-adherence is reported to be 28 to 52% for major depressive disorder. 20 to 50 percent for bipolar disorder and 20 to 72 percent for schizophrenia which scores the highest and approximately 40 percent of the patients stop taking the prescribed antipsychotic medication within one year and about 75 percent they discontinue their medication within two years even with the depot injection about 25 percent of the patients they stop keeping the scheduled appointments and no longer they receive depot injections within one year after starting treatment. So this is the scenario in our specialty across various disorders. And what is its impact? It is going to predict the outcome and which is going to be very poor because whenever there is a non-adherence, the hospital admissions are going to happen. Re-hospitalizations are going to happen. So they say that 58% of uh, patients with schizophrenia or a schizoaffective disorder Non-compliance was the main reason for hospital admission. It increases the risk of violence because when the patient is going to be non-adherent, uh, the risk of violence is going to increase. And this is supported by a meta-analysis by Witt et al. who showed a moderate association between non-compliance and violence in psychotic patients with an odds ratio of 2.0. And, and it also increases the risk of suicide. And they say that the low adherence, it doubled the odds of suicide attempts in patients with major depressive disorder. And also, in a study by Cullen et al., he said it also increased the risk of premature mortality. So this is how the impact is going to happen. And uh, with regard to non-adherence, the classification differs across different uh, articles that has been published. Uh, the pattern of non-compliance, like there, will be, there may be total non-compliance where the patient doesn't take the medications at all. It can be intermittent or partial non-compliance or it is a late, no, a late compliance or overuse of medication, which is a very, very rare entity. And sometimes it can be an unintentional or intentional non-compliance as the name goes and uh, drug holidays and white coat compliance. As the patient is going to see the doctor for the last uh, few days before the visit, he will take the medications. So these are the different varieties. And there is also another classification to address, to classify this. They say that it can be single drug non-adherence or a multiple drug or it is voluntary or involuntary. So there are different classifications. So before we could uh, uh, find out the ways to address the non-adherence, it is very important as how we measure the adherence. So measuring adherence and non-adherence is a very, very complex topic. 
and uh, it is not very easily defined because there are various methods as how we can measure the adherence. There are direct methods as well as indirect methods. When we say direct methods, it is directly observed therapy, like patient is swallowing the medication in front of the treatment provider and using a biomarker or a drug level where you will measure the drug levels in the body and then there you ensure compliance to the medication and using some electronic monitor which will send a signal to the uh, people who ma maintain the data and thereby ensuring the adherence to medications. So these are the direct methods and we have indirect methods as well like filling the questionnaires like when the patient comes for, comes to follow up we have a lot of scales which we can administer to check whether the patient is adherent to the medications or not and we have the refill records and the diaries. So whether it is a direct method or an indirect method so it is very difficult to exactly pinpoint where the problems arises and a direct method has a lot of advantages in the form of accuracy however it is invasive and it is expensive whereas indirect methods they are very easy to implement and uh, they have their own disadvantages and there are no reliable tools which exist for assessing the medication adherence in common psychiatric disorders next slide so this is a chart to show the various direct and the indirect methods uh, its own disadvantages as well as the advantages So coming to the barriers to medication adherence, because this is very important when we, before we move to uh, the, to find out the ways to address the non-adherence, uh, when it comes to barriers to medication adherence, we have patient specific barriers. Like when the patient is very young, he is from a very low socioeconomic status, minority group, and uh, he is not married. All these things can influence his adherence to medications. Coming to illness specific barriers like when the patient is having symptoms, very severe symptoms, or when he is not having insight, when there is a cognitive impairment, when there is no motivation. So all these things can influence the adherence. Coming to medication-specific barriers, we have uh, side effects related to the medications, that is obesity or extra pyramidal symptoms, which will influence and thereby the patient stops taking the medication. So coming to the healthcare and system-specific barriers, uh, very uh, difficulty to find uh, appointments or difficulty in follow-up care. So all these things will influence the uh, adherence in people uh, who are on psychotropics. And coming to social and culture specific barriers, the cultural beliefs will definitely influence the adherence to the medications. And at last, the financial barriers where the person is not having enough resources, he will not be adherent to the medications for a long time especially in people who suffer from severe mental illness. Next slide. And this is a table to show how a dosing frequency can improve the adherence. In the left side of the figure, as you see, uh, when the medication schedule is given once daily, the rate of adherence is higher. However, if the medication schedule is four times a day, the rate of adherence drops down. In the second figure on the right side, you can see when the patients are developing side effects. Here, they have charted out obesity as a risk factor. And when the patients develop obesity as a side effect, then the rate of uh, non-compliance increases in people who are taking the medications. Next slide. So this is a famous ADIA study, which has been published in CNS Spectrum in 2010. And where they have tried to compare uh, uh that whether oral medications or long acting depot medication long acting depot are best in people in uh, schizophrenia and uh, they found that long acting injectable antipsychotics they improve the compliance and the patient follow up next slide in another systematic review which has been published in 2020 uh, it is about psychotropic medication non adherence and its associated factors among patients with major psychiatric disorders. And in that, they found 49% of the patients with major psychiatric disorders, they were non-adherent to the psychotropic medication. And it is highest for schizophrenia, that is 56%. And bipolar disorder, it is 44%. And they found that there are various factors which will influence the non-adherence, like the patient behavior, lack of social support, the clinical or treatment related issues, the illness related factors 
and health system factors. And higher levels of psychiatric medication non-adherence was seen in major uh, psychiatric disorders and they suggest the need for comprehensive intervention strategies to address these factors. Next slide. So there are various models which tries to explain as to why a patient is non-adherent to the medications. And this is one uh, famous model that is a perception and the practicalities approach, which is PAPA model, which is uh, proposed by Chapman, uh, which has been published in Current Opinion of Psychiatry in 2013, where they say that non-adherence, it is a product of a range of perceptual factors and practical factors. As you can see in the left side of the slide, where you uh, where your picture is shown and uh, when it comes to perceptual factors it is all about the patient's belief about their illness and the treatment so this is going to influence their motivation and thereby the patient will go in for a intentional non-adherence and the practical factors that is the capacity and the resources which are uh, uh, practical factors which will end up in unintentional non-adherence. So they say the non-adherence is a product of both these things that is a perceptual and the practical factors and uh, there are two key beliefs that have been implicated in the way in which the medications are prescribed. Belief in personal need for medication where the person should believe that the medication is going to help them and concerns about the potential adverse consequences of medication. So this necessity concerns framework has also been found to have utility in explaining non-adherence across long-term conditions. Next slide. So how are we going to tackle non-adherence in psychiatry? It is about psychosocial interventions and the pharmacological interventions. Next slide. So coming to psychosocial intervention, there are a lot of fancy terms in it. and uh, But majority of the things which we will be doing routinely in our practice, knowingly or unknowingly. Starting with psychoeducation, just simple psychoeducation wherein we educate the patients and their families about the illness and the medications is going to improve the adherence. Second thing is about behavioral training where we use techniques like reminders, simplifying the dosing schedules and using certain reinforcement strategies are going to improve the adherence in these settings. And coming to motivational interviewing where we emphasize the benefits of adherence and the strategies to overcome the drawbacks. And there is one more therapy called as compliance therapy, where it combines the elements of CBT to improve the insight and the treatment acceptance. There is also another method called treatment adherence therapy. And finally, we have the cognitive behavioral therapy, wherein it identifies and modifies the negative thoughts about the medication. So in whatever way, these therapies are going to help the patient identify where they miss it out and uh, thereby in trying to improve the adherence in this group of people. Next slide. Coming to the pharmacological intervention, a simple method of optimizing the, uh, choosing the drugs. That is very important to improve the adherence and uh, adjusting the doses, treating the side effects whenever the patients report, simplifying the regimes instead of giving TID doses, giving once a daily dose will ease the rate of adherence. And long-acting injectable medication is always recommended. And simplifying the medication regimes can help patients with cognitive impairment. Next slide. So whatever it is, whether it is a psychosocial or a pharmacological intervention, engaging patients and improve is very much important in improving the adherence because a good clinician-patient relationship, which is very much trust and caring relationship, is the one which is going to improve the adherence in whatever setting we are. Next slide. And apart from that, a shared decision making. That is wherein the patient is involved in the decision taking process, it will ensure adherence across the phase of the illness, not only in the initiation phase, in the implementation, even at the maintenance course of treatment. Next slide. Uh, this is one other article, review article, which has been published in Indian Journal of Behavioral Sciences recently and uh, where they have uh, tried to bring up, uh, come up with certain models to address this non-compliance. Uh, they have divided into three strategies, that is addressing the content, the delivery vehicle and a broader context, that is the settings. Next slide. Coming to the intervention content, 
uh, for improving the medication adherence it is all about the tailoring the interventions and uh, especially with regard to cbt they have found that uh, cbt techniques have helped especially in people who suffer from first episode psychosis to prevent the relapse they found that when the patients attended seven months of fortnightly individual therapy sessions the medication adherence sustained at 30 months of follow up and uh, there is also a discussion about the financial incentives uh, to be considered for patients so that that may improve the medication adherence next slide and uh, this article also discussed about the various delivery vehicles for medication adherence interventions where they discussed about the electronic monitoring and feedback the sms and the telemonitoring and the efficacy is almost always mixed in all these uh, methods next slide coming to the intervention context in medication adherence so it is uh, the cultural context that is very very important whenever uh, the people have a uh, reasons for non compliance and their beliefs about the treatment so when we have to tailor the intervention to the individual beliefs and that will be more effective than generalizing across the cultural group next slide so culturally adapted intervention uh, definitely improves the adherence this is supported by a study by koplovic uh, et al uh, who developed a culture, family intervention module in mexican american patients with schizophrenia and uh, he found that this tailored intervention improved the adherence 12 months post intervention so individual interviews with the patients informed the personalized intervention content next slide so this is one of the another article where they discussed about various technical uh, uh, strategies to improve the adherence uh, where they discussed about sending reminders supportive messages engaging existing social support building new, new social support and uh, giving feedback to the patient either patient directed or clinician directed using a passive education approach and a contingency management all these strategies can be improve the adherence Excellent. So again, uh, this encompasses the previous things which has been discussed about the healthcare system factors, the disease-related factors, the patient factors, the therapy-related factors, and the socio-economic factors. Uh, all needs to be addressed to improve the uh, adherence. Excellent. So a multimodal approach is needed, addressing almost all the domains, uh, catering to the individual needs of the patient, starting from the educational domain. changing the illness beliefs psychoeducation about the illness or the medications followed by the pharmacist or the nurses coming to the behavioral domain using some memory aids such as pill boxes or using blister packs or behavior cueing or reminder calls or texts uh, modifying the medication regime using an integrated care and uh, providing financial support and uh, the social uh, domain like involvement of the family or caregivers promotion of self reliance and improved access to care or community supports and finally utilizing the digital health technologies and medication even monitoring system will help to address the non adherence next slide so to conclude adherence is a dynamic process and non adherence is a major challenge in the management and non adherence leads to poor treatment outcomes psychosocial interventions such as psychoeducation cbt and motivational interviewing are commonly used and pharmacological interventions like simplifying the dosing regime dose selection it helps to improve the adherence and a multimodal approach helps in promoting the adherence next slide so it's much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of a disease a patient has thank you thank you ma'am that was an uh, excellent presentation uh sir can we proceed to the q and a yes sir we can okay uh we have got uh, two questions in uh, chat uh, one is to uh, sudhakar sir uh, sir the question is uh, any other alternative for theory exam final year theory exam like objective questions that has been asked to you sir uh thank you sir thank you for the question uh i think this question is for the uh, post graduate uh, with that understanding uh theory exams at the end of 3 years uh, post graduate think that is the better way to handle because for the first uh, two and a half years 
they just come to the uh, OPD clinic, see the patients, go to specialty postings. But uh, we all see them struggle at the last few months for the examination. So the better option which we would have put forth or in most of the articles by all the senior psychiatrists would be a theory exam at the end of each semester. I think uh, theory exams alone where we have uh, two essay questions and uh, uh, 10 short notes, that is what is being uh, uh, present in all the university exams. Uh, multiple choice questions, yes, is considered to be one of the very good standard methods of assessment for a postgraduate. And that can be included again, uh, formulating multiple choice questions again. Uh, the teachers or the faculties, you have to undergo training to formulate better multiple choice questions. And still, among all the ways of examination, it is considered to be one of the standard methods. This can be added along with your uh, whatever essay and short notes. But the best thing would be to have an exam at the end of each semester where uh, residents can focus. Uh, say in your first year, you focus on your basic science, uh, your neuroanatomy, physiology, and chemistry. And that will help both the uh, faculties as well as the students uh, to improve on their academics. And yes, MCQs would be a better option in addition to the existing uh, theory exams. And uh, ma'am, Geetanjali ma'am wants to raise some point. Uh, yeah. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sudhakar told, uh, semester-based uh, pattern of exams that is uh, uh, covering uh, psychology, neurology and psychiatry, we wrote exams in our period, university conducted like that only. First year we had uh, basic psychology, abnormal psychology, anatomy, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, where we had both the theory and practical and the, for the practical we had the physiology professor, anatomy professor, everybody uh, came and the uh, practicals was conducted. That was a better uh, way of uh, uh, crossing the milestones as uh, in the UK based education or in Australia based education. They all have a long duration of uh, post graduation that is five years and uh, four years. We are having only three years. But this method was a little bit ideal. Uh, that uh, complete, coming to know about psychology before you learn fully about psychiatry. The university has changed the pattern and uh, it is uh, the role of the psychiatrist to address to the university to bring back that pattern. In the second year, we had medicine and neurology, both theory and practical. And final exam was the uh, psychiatry exam. That would be a better option to make the students cross the milestones gradually and for them to learn it in a very good way and the foundation will be very good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your input, sir. And uh, we have one more question for uh, Lakshmi Prabha, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the question is, are there studies that compare uh, medication adherence in different psychiatric disorders? Uh, so across all psychiatric disorders, uh, I didn't come across any article. However, there is one uh, recently, uh, there's one uh, good article that has been published in Frontiers in Psychiatry uh, last year, January to 2022, where I, wherein they compared across uh, from affective to the psychotic spectrum. And uh, they found uh, that uh, uh, that is one important article which I have come across. And uh, they have taken into account of uh, the comorbid substance use, the personality factors, everything, how it influences the non-adherence in this group of disorders. That's it, sir. Okay. Uh, if there are any other questions, you can share in the chat box. Uh, uh, sir, uh, finally, my comments for you, sir. Can I get an answer yes, for sir. that, sir? sir. Hmm. Yes, sir. We are asking a, a series of questions. Uh, whatever you have asked, for what I remember, uh, sir, uh, I generally see this uh, comment from most of the teachers, the attitude of the undergraduates or even the postgraduates have changed drastically at present. This is a comment across all the specialties. You take our colleagues in medicine, surgery, OG, you see. There is a change in attitude of almost nearly majority of the students, both UG and PG. I think uh, this is a change that is inevitable. This is how students are going to be. And uh, as I have told that we still keep saying that in our days, we used to be trained. In our days, we used to be trained. I think this is the way the students are going to be. And uh, they want, they have everything. They think the knowledge is there, right there in their hands with their uh, gadgets. So I think that is where we need to move on to certain innovative methods 
where you involve them apart from your traditional uh, lecture based learning if you go to a theory class for the pre final years we see most of them lying down sleeping uh, going into their gadgets and they don't have any uh, uh, what to say they don't think that it is wrong to behave that way in the classroom but again teachers they say it's not the way you should behave you should change and all these things i think we need to understand what kind of students these people are and as i have told there are different types of learners and uh, we need to understand what kind of learning would suit them uh, rather than uh, lamenting about the attitudes of students right so we need to change our perspective and our teaching methods uh, try to have a cordial relationship with the students i think this is where effective feedback and appraisal so whether this method of teaching could suit you or you think other methods of teaching could help them i think as far as undergraduates are concerned uh, uh, we involve them in a lot of uh, uh, role play uh, as i have told and uh, we involve them in a lot of quiz competitions where they ask them to do we give them certain uh, phenomenology say hallucination delusions and uh, we give them explain to them and then they are asked to enact which they do better and even we do it for nursing students so i think the teaching methods has to change and we need to accept the students who are there at present with those attitude so that we can improve on our own method and uh, as far as your question on uh, formative assessment uh, again uh, when we try to impose certain changes on the current post graduates right you have to do this you have to uh, spend a lot of time with the patients you need to take a detailed history taking but still Uh, we find there is a big difference that they are not able to do it, and that is where we felt since this is a, a formative assessment which the form the M C F given, uh, we thought uh, presenting this every month by the S S R and discussing with them why we have given less number of marks in say attitude towards the patients or the caregivers or your presentation log book might help them to change not in the immediate next few months but maybe. after a period of 6 months to 1 year when they see that they can score considerably low in their formative assessment and you know internal assessment the marks if they are not able to get the supposed internal assessment i think it is difficult for them for to even appear for the exams so it is a long way to go but i think we need to start initiating these things definitely. maybe it might work but we have to wait and watch definitely sir definitely uh yes sir hi uh, uh, sorry to interrupt our uh, ah, yes, this is sir, dr please. sivai lango ah yes sir just yes. couple of uh, comments i think sure. uh, excellent presentation by dr sudagar and dr lakshmi prabha i really thank uh, i think the scientific committee for choosing this particular topic about uh, the training of psychiatry in india right now what's the way forward because i think uh, as you we all know that the cbme has come in uh, some few years ago now, right now and still we are in the initial stage and uh, there is a lot of discrepancy between private colleges and government colleges i think as uh, probably a lot of people are around uh, aware uh, if you take ramachandra savita and including the place where i work in kerpagamnayaga i think they give a lot of importance they already implemented uh, quite a bit of things in terms of lesson plan ilos and uh, uh, feedback assessments and so on however uh, the government colleges i don't think uh, that's been the case so probably uh, with the years to come when the uniformity in terms of uh, you know the trainers particularly they need to go on training like cis fund uh, cbme uh, implementation program and probably things will be put in place that's number one and uh, definitely uh, i think one of the question you asked is about whether is there uh, any uniformity in terms of you know we have the uh, you know whatever the competencies that they require but the, how we are going to implement the competence in terms of which is our knowledge attitudes and skills and the, how we are going to whether it's a lecture or is it the procedural skills that we are going to or other innovative methods i think from what i gather uh, the uh, ips uh, the national body are already on to it i think uh, a lot of you are aware that uh, the ug education committee and the pg education committee in in alliance with the itops the indian teachers of secretary forum they have already uh, working out uh, a uniform uh, you know implementation across the india uh, how we could uh, work out this uh, cbme uh, curriculum for the training uh, for the ug training if i remember that the latest discussion from the nmc uh, uh, director uh, the next exam when it comes in place probably in the next year or the following year two oscis will definitely be in secretary out of the uh, you know 10 or 12 
so you can it's not a separate exam but in the next there will definitely be minimum of two askies you can expect in this psychiatry so future is changing uh, we need to be brave for um, improving it i think the culture has to you know um, the acceptance has to come from uh, the practicing psychiatrists or the trainers in the psychiatry thank you thank you for your comments sir any other comments uh, arul sir and sir please yeah good evening a uh, wonderful lecture and i uh, congratulate both the speakers of today dr sudhakar and dr lakshmi ma'am for uh, excellent presentation just a few comments uh, recently we had a national level cme on the 4th of november uh, at kolkata this was basically for the ug and pg cbme curriculum which has been you know slowly being rolled out across the country and uh, along in partnership with uh, itops and the uh, e zone uh, branch of the ips and uh, from the south part of it dr vikas menon dr kishore from karnataka and dr christina from kerala and uh, myself we uh, participated in that and of course it was divided into ug and pg uh, you know there were initial uh, uh, presentations on the cbme in uh, the later half uh, two uh, groups one for the undergraduate program and one for the postgraduate program was uh, formed and uh, there was a lot of uh, brainstorming that was going on and with regards to the uh, undergraduate uh, program what many of the uh, it was an eclectic mixture meaning there were uh, people from uh, uh, national institutes there were people from government uh, uh, medical colleges people from private uh, Uh, teaching institutions which have postgraduate program so uh, essentially uh, the consensus uh, arrived was that for ug you know uh, psychiatry probably the only way forward is to push for you know uh, having at least an undergraduate level examination towards the end of their uh, mbbs program either in the third mbbs or even at the final mbbs so that is one thing which has been on the table and being discussed and you know ips is pushing forward for that and once uh, uh, because without any examination it becomes quite optional for the student that uh, they don't take it uh, uh, really seriously and that was acceptable probably when we were doing you know uh, undergraduate studies Uh, but now things are changing and post covid there is a lot of change and uh, uh, of course in a change world the uh, mental health morbidity is also quite uh, rapidly increasing and that needs to be addressed and the only way forward because now nfc is keeping a ceiling about how many post graduate shall come out how many doctors so we need to look at uh, ways of producing primary care physicians who are able to identify basic mental health issues and are able to address those issues effectively at the phc and grassroots level and if needed they can refer the cases to a specialist so except if we don't we are not going to have ug examination you know things are not going to be taken that was uniform across the uh, across uh, everyone who was present and uh, even though ug cm cbme for psychiatry is uh, implemented and is being rolled out Uh, unfortunate thing is that there is not even one single certifiable competency so again it becomes like something which is on the paper and which is not really being you know given adequate importance so the first step towards having an ug examination would be to have certifiable competencies basic things like how to you know interview a patient or how to break bad news such kind of things which are required at the undergraduate level can be you know kept as a certifiable competency Uh, uh, if you look it into uh, pg uh, on the other hand this is from the student perspective on the other hand from the teachers perspective also there was an interesting discussion going on we as psychiatry teachers are more uh, uh, let us say trained <laughs> to teach post graduates we are not trained to teach the undergraduates that was something which uh, was quite interesting because we really Uh, our focus is totally on the post graduates and we have very limited time which we you know uh, focus on the undergraduate students and uh, so that is one area which probably we need to uh, work on 
when we come to the postgraduate uh, teaching of course there is a huge discrepancy uh, in terms of resources and you know human resources faculty strength and so on and so forth we cannot compare this you know like say for instance at national institute of importance like nimhans and if you are going to compare it with <laughs> a medical college uh, 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 in down south or in karnataka it's going to be vastly different you cannot compare i am at chennai with any of the institutes uh, elsewhere so these are diverse uh, you know institutions which are trying to have a standard format so that by itself is a challenge and what uh, uh, is uh, uh, is was advised or put forth was to have uh, the use of uh, technology as sudhakar was saying probably we need to uh, move towards you know adapting technology uh, so that we are able to uh, capture the imagination of our young learners say for instance log book now you have uh, but that is just a log of what the day to day activities or the important activities a post graduate is doing uh, over the 3 years and we need we know that it has to be accompanied by a portfolio where you know he can describe it in detail and, and also make reflective you know uh, he can reflect on the things that has been going on on the day or on a particular topic and so on and so forth so probably having an e portfolio which can be uniform or standardized across so that you know it would be useful for uh, all of our post graduate that was that is something which we were uh, discussing and of course formative and summative assessment definitely need to have formative assessment no point in having summative assessment one simple example is like you know uh, covid the pg has been working with us and he has been toiling for all 3 years and it becomes difficult at the end of the period to you know uh, show him his progress or to uh, even for the teacher it becomes difficult for someone who has been sincere who has been you now working along and to deny a pass or fail which is being decided by the summit to assessment could be cruel on the part of the teacher as well as you know difficult for the student as well so it is better to have formative assessment uh, at least semester wise and this can be you know discussed and shared with the post graduate uh, exams at the end of uh, first year second year and third year an excellent idea uh, probably we need to as we say life is a circle probably we need to get back to that uh, pattern as well only difficulty will be for the universities because they need to conduct uh, you know a massive exercise for all uh, at least for psychiatry that they have three examinations during the course of md psychiatry and uh, at the end of the day the common theme is uh, whether this can be standardized we need to accept that you know uniformity is something which we are trying to achieve but we have to accept the fact that we need, we do have unity in diversity and that diversity has also to be preserved like as sivayalangu sir was saying there are certain unique things which are available in uh, some of the you know uh, uh, smaller centers as well so those needs to be done there is no point in saying okay you need to have 11 special clinics what is the point when you don't have uh, you know uh, cases for those uh, 11 clinics rather allow that uh, you know, liberal uh, stance of deciding upon what uh, special clinic you need to have in your own department so such things uh, were discussed and uh, it is a difficult challenge it's a changing attitude probably the undergraduate also has a module of adcom so if that is going to bring about a change in the attitude and even otherwise the huge pressure that is on the learner probably this will also help in shaping uh, those interested learners who are going to take up psych thank you and we need to be prepared for that thank you thank you thank you sir thank you for your comments dr pp kanan sir wants to raise some points sir this is only to thank our speakers who have done a very wonderful job and really enriched the enriched program so i thank both of them for doing a good job that is my comment on this program thank you for the opportunity thank you sir yes sir there are any other questions we can uh, there are no other questions i think uh, we can come to a conclusion uh, okay uh, in uh, on behalf of the uh, 
present uh, organizing committee i thank uh, the presenters you have done a very exceptional job uh, and uh, these both these topics are being very relevant and uh, we have gained a lot from your discussions and uh, and i thank the opportunity for being uh, given to moderate this session and i also thank uh, dr geetanjali madam for being the chairperson for this session and uh, since uh, we are uh, running out of time uh, i once again thank the uh, east west pharma for providing the support for uh, uh, conducting this sessions i think i can uh, ask dr pani selvam sir to take over thank you sir uh, thank you dr avade pan It's a great presentation by uh, Dr. Zdayar and uh, Dr. Rajiv Brahma. It's a really wonderful presentation. And I thank Dr. Audeepan uh, sir and Vidal Chowdhury madam for accepting this uh, program for the chairperson and moderator. Thank you all the participants. Thank you very much. NTC is going in a great way. It reached the attendance more. It reached near 100. Thank you all.